So, um, my name's Roy Dingen. I'm, I'm, um, I've, I've been with Alt-E now for about two years. And prior to that, I worked at a number of inverter manufacturers. And one of the things that I've learned, I worked for Trace and Xantrex and Schneider and Alpac a couple times and SMA. And one thing I've learned is that basic commissioning a battery-based system is pretty similar, whether it's one brand or another, whether it's on-grid or off-grid, whether it's a 72 kW system in the middle of the Colombian jungle or a small single inverter with a single battery, with a single battery and a single solar panel, the, the concepts are the same. And so that's what we're gonna to cover today. Um, the main goal of this is to take steps to avoid destroying your new expensive equipment. You know, it's, that's really the goal. Um, so what we're not going to cover are design and sizing issues. Um, you know, we have an hour and, and it's, gonna take, it's gonna take our full hour here to just to cover uh, the commissioning of a system and all the steps involved to do it, do it right. And we're not going to also cover installation issues. So that's a that's a whole different topic. This we're making the assumption that your system was designed and installed, and now you're ready to fire it up. So that's where we're going. So, as I said, off grid, on grid, battery based systems really doesn't make that much difference. It's just a matter of what your AC input comes from, whether you're coming from the grid or whether you're coming from um, a generator. That's the biggest difference between the two. So. The um, concepts here should cover both. I'm going to do my very best to be brand agnostic. Um, I, I, I'm not trying to fly a flag for any particular inverter company, um, whether one I worked for in the past or not. And uh, we, you know, that's not my goal here. Um, I've had to choose an inverter kind of a system for, the, for, for examples of pointing out things. And so um, it's not a, I hope it doesn't come across as a commercial, but um, more. Um, yeah, I want this to be brand agnostic. And I think all the concepts are the same. And as such, not being brand agnostic, we're not gonna do a programming deep dive. We're not gonna be, for instance, saying to get to the absorbed voltage, you will press this button, that button, scroll to this or that. We'll basically be talking about why you're doing that in a general sense, okay? Also, we won't be covering things like automatic gener generator start. We won't be covering time of use. We won't be covering sellback. We're going to get the inverters and the batteries and the charge controllers and the, and the battery monitors up and running so that things don't get damaged and that they're running. And from there, you need to you know, take on the next step. Primarily, this is geared towards do-it-yourselfers, though um, I don't know my audience mix here. and I don't know if I will before the end, but... Um, you know, grid tie installers, I think, can benefit from it greatly too, as they're, you know, maybe not used to doing battery based systems. So, um, electricians, I know I've talked to a lot of electricians that I would hope would come to this. Um, you know, they know their stuff better than I do, but they, when it comes to batteries, sometimes they, they, they could use a little guidance. So, that'll be the audience. Qualifications, there are some. Now, as a do it yourselfer or installer, um, regardless, if you're going to, install, operate, um, or you know, maintain a renewable energy system, particularly with batteries, you need the ability to use a voltmeter to safely and accurately measure AC and DC voltages you'll be dealing with, which leads you to the idea that you need to know what you'll be dealing with. If you're running a 600 volt array, you need to be prepared for measuring and confirming levels of voltage that high. So you do need to have the ability and the, the, the possession of a voltmeter for AC and DC voltages. And you need a basic understanding of the navigation of your particular equipment. So every brand has a different user interface as far as programming. And that is one thing that you're going to need to get used to. Um, we won't be covering, like I said, you know, specific navigation in here um, because it just, it would take weeks <laughs> to cover every every brand and so really that is on the that is on the installer or or on the and i think more importantly it's on the end user to learn to navigate their own equipment um you know um, anything goes wrong generally speaking it'll be outside the hours of tech support availability so you need to know how to run your system and have a voltmeter 
Now, all of this stuff should be actually handy in the end too. the, the information gathering we're going to do to, um, to troubleshoot as well. We aren't going to cover troubleshooting, but the stuff that we're going to cover here is going to help us in the future. So the basic steps we're going to do. So this is kind of like, I think it's kind of like painting a car. Um, I used to paint cars for a living many, many, many moons ago. And one thing is the preparation was more important than the actual applying of the paint. And it's the same thing here with commissioning a system. The pre-commissioning section of this is going to be the vast, probably majority of what we're going to cover today. Um, identifying the components, um, I'll go into reasons why I'm covering that, um, and gathering the information that we're going to need to commission it. That's basically a big step here. And um, there's some screens that you can use if you, you know, we'll, somehow we'll make this available as a PDF download that you can fill out, kind of almost form-like, um, to um, have some system information at hand before commissioning. And it's also handy to have two years down the road when you're maybe potentially troubleshooting. So um, then we're gonna go into commissioning and starting up the inverter charger. You know, we're gonna go through voltage verification, startup procedure, um, very basic inverter charger programming, and then a function test, again, basic. Charge controller, and your PV charge controller. We're gonna go through some basic voltage verifications and startup, some basic programming, basic function test. And the battery monitor, which is an optional item, but I find it generates a lot of phone calls. Um, and I want to describe basically how the function of it works um, and what the basic programming requirements are to make it as accurate as possible. So we're going to cover that. So again, I apologize for selecting a particular brand of equipment. That was not my goal here, but it's a fairly common system. And what I chose it for was the fact that it's an all-in-one pre-wired system. And the reason I chose that is because quite often I'll get customers that'll call me on a system like this and I'll and they'll ask me how to, you know, what do I do? And I'll say, well, what inverter do you have? And they'll say, uh, they'll look at the thing and they'll say, well, that's a classic. Well, that happens to be the charge controller in this case. So what I want to do is kind of dissect this system and know that it's not this, this particular picture is not the picture of an inverter. It's the picture of many components, well, basically six components that you need to understand the differences from. So, um, and yeah, so that's, so it starts with the inverter charger. The six major components we're going to be talking about are the inverter charger, the charge controller, PV charge controller, the user interface, the AC switch gear. We're going to go into a little bit of detail on this because part of commissioning is turning on breakers. Great idea to know what those breakers do. DC switch gear, same thing. And battery monitor, which again is optional, but fairly frequently used and commonly misunderstood. So that's the battery. So that's the components we're going to identify. So we start here. I'm going to move my little thing here so I can see better. Um, we start here with the inverter charger. And I'm very specific when I say inverter charger, not just inverter, though I'll probably mess up throughout the presentation and just say inverter. Um, but in reality, 99% of the time we're talking about a system we're commissioning, it's going to be an inverter charger, which means that it charges the batteries as well as creates, these, you know, creates AC from the batteries. And the term charger is one that we in the solar industry have co-opted to mean a very specific thing. And that is something that uses AC from the grid or a generator to charge the batteries. Though it does control the charge, it does not, we don't call it a charge controller. We're going to reserve that for something else. So if I ever say charger or somebody says charger, we're talking about something that uses AC. Now, something that's useful here in the naming convention on most inverters um, from our, because we're going to do some, we're going to do some information gathering is going to be the naming convention that most inverters use, right? And so if we look at this inverter that's on there, that's the, you know, the far right section here, this, this portion right here is the inverter charger. In this case, this could be a 4024 or a 4048. What those numbers mean, the first two numbers, generally speaking, I will never say always, mean how many kVA or kilowatts um, the unit is capable of operating at continuously. So the first two numbers, four zero, would denote a 4.0 kilowatt unit. Um, if it was an eight zero, that'd be an eight kilowatt unit. 
If it was a 68, that would be a 6.8 kilowatt unit. The second two numbers are going to be your DC voltage, right? Now that's important in our information gathering because if you were to connect a 48 volt battery bank, wire your battery bank for 48 volts, connect it to a 4024, you're going to hear a popping sound followed by a burning smell. The popping sound is the inverter FETs blowing. The burning smell comes from your wallet um, because that's a non-warrantable failure. So we're going to make sure we have the right battery voltage for the inverter. It's not programmable. You buy a 24 volt inverter, it's a 24 volt inverter. You don't make it into a 48 by some programming magic. PV charge controller, specifically PV. I'm not gonna go into wind, micro hydro, perpetual motion, any of these other things. We're just gonna cover PV charge controllers. And we here's where we use the term charge controller. And so it denotes that it's something that's using DC, you know, typically from solar. Um, again, it could be from wind, micro hydro, and other things, but for the most part, we're just going to talk about solar. And two important specifications that we're going to use in our information gathering are going to be max input voltage and max output current. This is all going to be done, hopefully, in your, you know, in your design and installation phase, but we're going to be wanting to know this when we're commissioning. And we'll get into how that works. So generally speaking, you know, there's usually an amperage number, you know, say 30, 60, 80, 100 amps output, and that's at whichever voltage we're dealing with. Um, and then there's a voltage input, which could be potentially 150, 200, 250, 600, and that's the max allowable voltage that the charge controller is allowed to take in. And we're going to need to know that when we verify the input voltage prior to turning it on so that we don't, again, the popping smell or the popping sound and the burning smell of your wallet. So if you exceed the um, input voltage of a charge controller, it doesn't last long. User interface, these vary. Um, in the beginning, the user interface was attached to every device that you bought. If you had a charge controller, it had a couple knobs that you could adjust or maybe an interface. Um, then companies started going towards a kind of a centralized um, user interface. Um, and people got upset that every in device didn't include one. Um, they had to buy a separate one. Um, now everybody's kind of going more towards computer, Bluetooth, that sort of a thing. And again, people are upset right now that they can't just buy a, buy a, um, you know, a, a, a standard programming, programming interface for their system. But the four I'm showing here are kind of representative of what you're going to be up against. What I didn't show is for instance, and I had on other graphics there, the, the charge controller in that, you know, in that graphic showing the charge controller in the system, um, that has its own user interface. But from a system interface or inverter interface standpoint, the one up on the upper left is a Magnum that uses, that's, that works for the Magnum system. The one on the upper right is a, um, an Outback uh, Mate 3S that's used for your, that's used for your Outback system. The one on the bottom right is the Schneider Insight Home, which is used on the Schneider system. And the one on the bottom left is the Victron MK3, I believe it's called a USB, which uses a computer interface to the Victron inverters. So things are, you know, that you need to know for your inverter what the user interface is and get used to getting around in it. Um, that's, that's a priority. So that's your user interface. From an AC switch gear standpoint, we need to know what our breakers do. Um, when you look at this wall of breakers here, you can see here, it's not the clearest graphic in the world, but we see two breakers here, we see four breakers here, we see two breakers here, and we see one breaker there. Now, this is a very common setup, which is why I chose this. And these black breakers here, these are going to be your AC switch gear. Now, if we had the dead front or the plate on here, there would be labels on here telling you what it is. Right now, we don't see that. So we're going to go by, you know, by, by memory here. But from we're going to cover first AC switch gear, then we're going to cover DC switch gear. So from an AC switch gear, we have four major components. Okay. We have the inverter's internal transfer switch, the inverter charger. Okay. That is inside this inverter charger. Okay. That's part of the AC switch gear. 
We also have the AC input breaker. In this case here, this breaker here, the far two left ones, it's 240, so it's a double pole, is the AC input breaker. The next ones over, the two here, are your AC output breaker. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be going over graphics here that you'll see how it fits in the system using my cartoons um, or <laughs> drawings, um, but we'll see closer what they do so you know where they are in the system. Then this last two over here are the AC bypass breakers. Now, the reason I'm covering this in a little bit more detail and some other things is commonly end users will confuse or even installers will confuse the, the, the functionality of the AC bypass breaker and the inverter's internal transfer switch. So I want to make sure that we understand the function and operation of both of those when we're starting the system up and running it. So we're going to go into some graphics now to kind of illustrate the AC switch gear. So very simplified, overly simplified drawing of a um, of an inverter here without even the batteries connected here. We see an AC input and we see an AC output. And in between those points, we see a transfer switch. So when an inverter sees no AC on its input, it's an inverter. So that transfer switch is open. This again is inside the inverter. When the AC is present on the input of that inverter, it closes the transfer switch and passes it through to the output. That's built into the inverter charger. And you should know the pass-through capacity of your particular inverter. That's one of the things on a spec sheet that's very handy to know. Most cases, it's either a 30 amp or a 60 amp, but it can vary. So that's the inverter charger by itself. That was component one of our AC switch gear, okay? Component two and three were our AC input breaker and our AC output breaker. So we can see here if the AC input breaker is off in the open position and the generator is running, it's never going to reach the inverter. So we, it's kind of nice to know what that AC input breaker does. If the inverter is inverting and the AC output breaker is off, then our energy is not going to be reaching our load center. That's going to be to the right there. So the main purpose of these breakers, as in most breakers, is to protect the conductors, is to protect the wiring going from the inverter to the load center or from, the, from a generator, things like that. But it also, in this case here, does serve a, an additional function of protecting that internal transfer relay. So in other words, if this was a 30 amp transfer relay, we probably wouldn't want to have 100 amp wiring on either side of the inverter, okay? So that's all going to be in the design phase, but just kind of be aware of that. Now, the next thing we're going to cover here is the bypass. This is the most commonly misunderstood portion of, you know, of, of an inverter charger, particularly a pre-wire system. Um, and so what we see here now is we've just added to it. We added this line that's going from the AC input side, going straight over to the AC output side. And then we see an additional breaker here. That's your AC bypass. That was the far right breakers on your system, right? The AC breakers. And you'll see a dotted line here between the two. And what that is, is you'll see there's a slider plate or a preventer of some sort to keep you from turning both the AC output and the AC bypass breaker on at the same time. And the reason for that is if we were to be able to close the AC output breaker and the AC bypass breaker, we would then have AC coming in from either generator or grid, following this wire through the breaker into the output of the inverter, which will cause at the very least a um, inv inverter AC wired to output error. At worst, that popping sound with the burning smell of wallet could occur, although not <coughs> likely, but it could. So in this case here, what I'm showing is the inverter in normal operation. These breakers don't have to be changed every time you start the generator. You leave the AC input breaker on, you leave the AC output breaker on, and you leave the AC inverter bypass in open position. So this is what we call normal position. When you start the generator, it comes in, passes through the inverter, goes out to the output. The purpose of the bypass is in the event that the inverter were to fail or the batteries were to do you know, completely dead. Because, for instance, on the output of this inverter, if this was on a grid type battery backup system, this would be your critical load panel. If this was an off-grid home, this would be your standard load center, right? Your main panel. 
So wouldn't it be nice if there was a failure of the inverter or the batteries to be able to get your generator or the grid to bypass the whole inverter and just get power to your loads? That's what the bypass is for, and that's what it would look like in bypass position. We would now have the AC output breaker forced to be off. We would have the AC coming around, going out to your loads, not backfeeding the inverter. You could potentially close the AC input breaker and charge the batteries, but chances are the inverter is not going to be working anyway, if that's why you're doing it. So that is the function of the bypass. So again, the bypass and the transfer relay are different. So when we're powering things up and going through our startup procedure, that's the breakers we're tripping. DC breakers. Here we have some really oversimplified cartoons of mine. And the DC breakers we're going to cover are much simpler here. So the if we go back to this slide here, we see these two breakers here, right? That's going to be labeled in our, you know, on the front plate when it's installed, PV in and battery out probably. And this is where I'm, it, it kind of varies on the labeling here. PV input breaker is usually called PV input breaker, but the battery output breaker, it can be called charge controller output breaker. It could be called charge controller battery breaker. It could be called a number of things similar to that. So we're gonna have a combiner box out there. That's part of your installation. So I'm not gonna cover that, but the PV input breaker is on your pre-wire panel. If you have a pre-wire panel, if not, you have probably some kind of a breaker box with a PV input breaker. So that protects the conductor between the PV input of the charge controller to the combiner box. The other breaker is your battery output breaker. That's going to protect the conductor between the battery output of the charge controller and the battery. So pretty straightforward. Um, had a customer call the other day complaining their charge controller wasn't working. It wasn't charging the batteries. Then the customer asked me, is it important that the PV input breaker is in the on position? You can see where that would go. Um, no PV input, no charging. So just again, knowing what these breakers we're going to talk about tripping or changing state of what they do. So there's your, that's pretty much your PV breakers in a simple form, right? Inverter breaker, that's the big one. If I go back here, that's the easiest one to find. You find the biggest breaker, chances are overwhelming. Um, it's either gonna probably be, depending on your inverter, it could be a 175, 175 amp breaker, could be a 250 amp breaker, but it's gonna be protecting the conductor between the inverter and the battery. Common question is, what size breaker do I need for my inverter? And the answer is, I don't know. It depends on your conductor. If you, have a, if you had a 20,000 watt inverter with six gauge battery cables, you would still need a 60 amp breaker, which would not work very well. So the breaker is sized to protect the conductor, not the inverter. So size your conductor properly and everything will be okay. Battery monitor. This is optional, but it is also pretty handy. It, um, there's no product that can give you a snapshot of battery state of charge. Okay. So that's the first thing. And so what the battery monitors do is they measure current flow in and out of the batteries. And they do that with this thing in the bottom left-hand corner called a shunt. And a shunt is nothing more than a resistance, a very low, very high precision resistance. And um, the most commonly used shunt is called a 500 amp 50 millivolt shunt, which means that if I measured with a voltmeter from here to here across this known resistance, and it was 500 amps flowing to the battery, I would measure 50 millivolts. That's what that means. If I was to, if I was to have um, 500 amps leaving the battery, it would read negative 50 millivolts. So this thing is gonna tell us, or tell the battery monitor by just by a simple voltage measurement, how much current is flowing in or out of your battery bank. And then, so we have different models. You know, there's, I, I put, I hope of all of the brands that we carry. Um, I may have missed somebody, I apologize we have, but we have the Schneider one, the up in the upper left, the Schneider, I forget what they call it, the battery monitor, I believe, uh, that works with the Schneider system. The one in the middle here, that's the uh, Whizbang Junior from Midnight. It just basically communicates to their controller. So you would read the results on the Midnight Charge Controller. We have in the bottom right, the FlexNet DC from Outback that works with the Outback system. We have the Magnum BMK that works with the Magnum system. And then we have the Victron, uh, BMV712, I believe it's called, that works well, either with the Victron system or standalone. So if you're, you know, so make sure that whatever battery monitor you've chosen works with your system, that's important to know. 
since these things are taking just a voltage measurement and calculating, basically coming up with a calculation to approximate a chemical reaction, and it can only be so accurate, don't expect them to, if you connected every one of these battery monitors to the same shunt, I would almost guarantee you that every one of them would read differently. It's an imprecise science. It's like a clock that's off a minute a day. So we have to reset the clock every day. If we, if we have a clock that's off a minute a day, but every day the noon whistle blows, we reset it. Well, then it's gonna be close enough for, you know, for our purposes. So that's where we need to occasionally reset it to full. I'm gonna cover that, actually this will be the last topic, which is programming the battery monitor so that it does reset whenever the batteries get full. If we didn't, think about it. If the battery monitor was off by 1% a day, which I don't believe any of them are that accurate, over 30 days, it'd be 30% off. So we need to do this occasionally. Next step, and this is gonna be available as a PDF um, somewhere. So you can actually just fill in these next few sheets if you wanted to. Uh, I was gonna put it all on one sheet, make it kind of a nice little sheet to fill out, but then it really got small on the screen. So I divided it up. Um, but what we're gonna do here is we're gonna gather some information about our system. We're gonna do this prior to commissioning. And the reason is, we, we do this footwork prior to doing it. We're gonna have everything in our hands, ready to go to do everything for a startup of the system. Also, it's kind of handy to have this information laying around the house when two years down the road, you're kind of going back and troubleshooting or something. Um, you know, quite often when I talk to customers, um, you know, they'll, they'll, I'll ask them to say, oh, my inverter is shut down and it won't work, what should I do? And I'll say, well, what model inverter do you have? And they say, well, I don't know, you sold it to me. Can't you look me up? Um, at that point, I'm very polite, but I cry inside a little bit. Um, it really, you should know what you have. And so gathering this information, I think is critical to any homeowner, regardless of commissioning, regardless of anything else. So it's good information to know, all of it is useful. So the first thing is gonna be our inverter charger and the charge controller, okay? I'm not going into quantities here. If you have more than one, you're probably gonna to wanna to note that in your, you know, in your notes, you can make it, you know, use this information, make your own list if you want. Inverter model, right? We're gonna fill out the inverter model. System DC voltage, well, that's gonna be dictated by the inverter model, right? So we're gonna have either probably 12, 24 or 48 volt system, and then we should know that. System AC voltage, we could have a 120 only inverter. We could have a 120, 240 inverter. We should know that as well. Charge controller model. We should know what model charge controller and quantity of them, of course, but for the purposes of this, we're just gonna just cover the model. Maximum watts at your particular voltage. Um, I won't cover array sizing here. You can ask that question later, um, but it's gonna vary by your system voltage. Um, you know, the lower the voltage, the less the capacity, because it's based on output amps, right? And the maximum voltage of your charge controller. That's an important one. If you exceed it, you blow the charge controller up generally. So make sure you know that information going into it. Because when we're verifying the voltage coming into it, we're, we're going to be measuring not to find out what it is. We're going to be measuring to verify that it's correct, right? So that's what we're doing. So we need to know what is correct. From a battery bank standpoint, this is a great one to have on your back pocket too. Um, you know, what battery model do you have? How many volts is each of these batteries? How many amp hours is each of these batteries? The number of batteries, the system DC voltage, and the total number of amp hours. Some of these are gonna be necessary for programming here. Um, some of them aren't, but they're good to have in your back pocket. Just know your battery bank. So, Set points. This is one that comes from specifically from your battery manufacturer, right? If you have kilovolt batteries, call us up. If you have batteries, um, you know, if you have homebrew batteries, I don't, I, I, I don't know what to tell you. Um, you know, that's you're on your own on that one. Um, but you're going to want to get the charge parameters for your particular batteries, and those charge parameters include your bulk slash absorb volts. Note that some manufacturers call it bulk, some call it absorb, but it's the same voltage. And we're gonna I'll do a brief one on three-stage charging here for those of you who don't understand it. I'll, I'll cover that after I get through these numbers here. Absorb time, how long you wanna be in absorb. Again, don't worry, I'll cover what that means. And float volts, okay? Some batteries don't actually specify a float voltage, they specify two-stage charging, um, but we'll get to that as well. 
um, max charge ramps, charging amps, that's your, for your battery. Generally speaking, if you need to adjust your charge ramps of your system down, that means that you have smaller battery bank than you probably should. Rebulk recharge voltage, I'll explain that in a moment, but you wanna get all these numbers from your manufacturer. Oh, EQ volts, if applicable. So three-stage charging goes like this. You first turn on a charger, it goes into bulk mode and it brings it up to the bulk slash absorb volts. So that climb up there, we're gonna be seeing maximum charge amps because we're going up in voltage. Once we get to that bulk voltage setting, a timer starts that you have set here with absorb time. It holds it at that voltage. And generally speaking, during that period of time, the current will taper because as the battery gets fuller and fuller, it will taper much more pronounced on lead acid than on lithium, but it will taper. After that period of time, the absorbed time, then we have de deemed that the, well, first I'll say at the end of the bulk volts, when we get up to bulk voltage, these are lead acid numbers. Uh, they're a little bit different on, on lithium, but on lead acid numbers, once you get a period, you're at about 80, about 80% 80 when you get to the bulk, up to bulk, at the end of absorb time, you're generally full. Okay, lithium has a much shorter absorb time, generally just a couple minutes where lead acid might have two, three hours, right? Float volts, that we're just gonna be on maintenance voltage. Um, I don't like using the word um, trickle charge, but it's gonna be a maintenance voltage that's gonna hold it there, right? So like for instance, your charge controller, your solar comes up in the morning, goes into bulk, holds it there for the absorb time and then drops to float and keeps the batteries full all day long, okay? Max charge amps, that's another thing specific, specified by the battery manufacturer. For instance, our kilovolt, the HLXs are, I believe most of them are hundred amps, if not all of them. So you don't want to exceed that because during the bulk phase, it will accept more. Um, rebulk, this is an important one, particularly with, um, with, with lithiums. Rebulk is at what point or at what voltage the charge controller or inverter will go back to a bulk cycle again. Right. So if you have this set too low, then your inverter charger or your charge controller may never go back into bulk again. It'll just go back into float the next morning. So we won't get too deep into the weeds on that one, but um, set it per your battery manufacturer recommendation. Equalize volts. Unless you're using flooded lead acid batteries, you won't be using this. Um, what I always recommend, though, is if you have a battery that says do not equalize, like a you know like you know a VRLA, like an AGM or gel or a lithium, set the equalized voltage on all your devices to the same as your absorb voltage, just in case somebody comes along and pushes that start EQ button. So that's one thing I have always recommended. So this is this is this is information we're gathering. We haven't even touched the inverter yet. It's just hanging on the wall, right? We're just going to get all these things ready to go. Inverter charger only set points. So these are not, I'm, I didn't cover all the battery charging because you will be charging all you know, the bulk absorbed float voltages that we just covered in the last one. But we'll get to that. But there's things on the inverter charger that are, that are unique to the inverter charger and not to say the charge controller. And those are low battery cutout volts. Again, battery manufacturer recommendation. This is when the inverter will shut down because of low battery to protect the batteries, right? Now, if you have DC loads as well, they could continue that to, to discharge the battery. So if you have DC loads, I would recommend talking to your salesperson about a DC load controller size sufficiently. We won't go into what that does, but it basically disconnects your DC loads um, because the inverter can't. Low battery cutout time. Generally, I kept that pretty, you know, it, it's pretty short. Um, and one thing I just want to point out here is the low battery cutout volts should be used like bumpers on your car. Um, just because you set your lithiums for 12 volt low battery cutout doesn't mean you should have your system so that every day you hit low battery cutout, right? You really do want to, you know, make sure that you're, you know, cognizant of how much power you're using and, and try not to hit low battery cutout every time you, you know, turn the thing on. Max AC input amps. This is an important thing for your basic programming. And what it's going to be is, for instance, with a generator, you would not want the inverter to think that you have 60 amps available from your generator when in fact you only have a 30 amp generator, right? So you're going to want to set that max AC input amps according to either your input breaker from your main panel on an on-grid system or your generator breaker in the case of a generator. So you want that set properly. It's one of the 
It's one of the big five or six that you really need to set on an inverter on or off grid. Charging algorithm, this is gonna be back to your battery manufacturer, two or three stage. Um, it's particularly important on the inverter because for instance, with lithiums, we don't necessarily wanna float them 24 hours a day, which the grid is available. So, on a, so that's gonna be either two or three stage. The difference between two and three stage is at the end of the absorption time, in two stage, the inverter just, or the, the charger just turns off. It doesn't go to float. So float becomes irrelevant. Still set it in case. Um, one I wanna cover here is because I get a lot of calls on this one, on or search mode. When you turn the inverter on, some inverters are defaulted to this thing called search mode. And so you turn the inverter on, you measure the AC output on the inverter and you see 16 volts and you're expecting 240. What it is, there's a power saving mode called search that's, um, that used to be very useful in the days of $10 a watt modules and incandescent light bulbs, 100 watt light bulbs. Um, but it has become less relevant now with the price of modules going down um, because that couple of watts extra to keep the inverter on isn't as critical. Um, and also it doesn't work well with low power bulbs. <laughs> so you'll, you'll, if you want more description on search mode, you know, call tech support or something like that. Just know that it's there. <laughs> Stacking, this one is only if you have more than one inverter in your system, but I do want to mention it. If you have stacking, if you have multiple inverters, you are going to want to look into what the procedure for stacking them is. And stacking is making multiple inverters operate as a single unit. So if you had, for instance, two FX inverters, FXRs, they call them now, and you're programming them for 120, 240, you have to program them accordingly, right? So you want to be just aware of that. If you have a single inverter, ignore it. Solar modules, this isn't going to really affect our, our programming, but I want to throw it in there just because it's a good thing to have, you know, again, ready, like, for, like I said, for a tech support call, um, you know, what the model of your module is, um, you know, all the specs really, but I mean, the ones that are really important, how many watts, what's the open circuit voltage, total number of modules that you have with the total watts, and the modules per string. This should have been done at the design phase. So for instance, if you had a module that puts out 40 volts open circuit and you have a charge controller that's capable of 150 volts maximum and you have four per string, we're gonna have a problem. And that's what we're gonna verify when we start measuring voltages now. So, um, but these are all things that are just good to have, okay? Good information. So the battery monitor. Remember I said that a battery monitor is only so accurate and we need it to reset every now and then. Um, I'm gonna have the, the final screen is gonna have actually the, the specific set points, but these are the things that we want to have ready for the battery monitor. And I'll have another list at the very end that has just the items and where to come up with that number. Total amp hours. So the battery monitor needs to know how many amp hours it is because it needs to know how many it's coming out of, right? So in other words, if I have a, 400 amp hour battery bank and it sees 200 amp hours leave it'll know that it's at 50 percent right so if you if you put that number in wrong it's going to have a you know a wrong starting point and everything's going to be wrong charged volts and then there's a d on the end of that charge whenever i talk to people about this i overemphasize that d the charged volts because it's not something that is controlling your charging of the inverter it's basically controlling when the battery monitor is going to reset. And in my humble opinion, it's better for the battery monitor to reset a little bit early than a little bit late, which is never, okay? Because if it never resets, then it'll lose accuracy over time and it'll be just garbage information, right? Return amps. This is basically as a battery gets fuller and fuller, the current goes down, 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 and we can actually use that amperage as an indicator of how full the battery is. If there's no, if the battery is not accepting current at that particular voltage, that means it's full. So we're going to use return amps, the settings, which will, again, we'll cover the specifics, about two to 5% of your battery capacity. But again, I'll have that coming up again. Battery efficiency. Oh, I hit that. Battery efficiency. That is the round trip efficiency of your battery. And this one's the hardest one to know. Um, from my experience, every battery manufacturer will tell you to set their particular battery at 95% and to set everybody else's at 80 because, yeah. Um, my feeling is 
that the reset parameters are more important. And at, over time, this number is going to change anyway. I set it my own view. You can play with this one a little bit. I set for 85% always. Um, gives you a little bit of headroom if it's better. Um, and if it's not that good, like if you have some old lead acid batteries, for instance, and it's not that good, we're still going to straighten things out with our reset parameters. And then there's a time function usually on how long we need to be to achieve all these parameters, right? So again, I'm going to cover that a little bit more because it's an important one. It, it generates a lot of phone calls. So I'm going to cover battery monitor programming better. So, so powering up the inverter, this, we, we've done most of the work already. We really have. I mean, the remainder here, I mean, the whole commissioning thing, I've got 15 minutes, I think, and I can finish that because we've done all the footwork. We've, we know what to do. Um, we know what to check. So we're going to start with all the breakers in the off or open position. Okay, first thing. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to verify our voltmeter operation. And what I mean by this, grab a battery that you know the voltage of, put it on DC volts, measure the voltage, make sure that it makes sense, swap the leads around so that the, the black is on the positive lead and the red is on the negative lead to make sure that, you're in, that your meter does in fact measure a negative voltage. I've had that happen before. Um, so just kind of get used to the idea of measuring a negative voltage because when we're gonna verify the correct voltage and polarity at the inverter breaker, we wanna make sure that we trust our meter. So we're gonna verify the correct voltage and polarity at the inverter breaker. And then the scariest part of this whole procedure is to turn on that big old breaker um, because it's got big battery cables that's connected to the battery. And when you turn that inverter breaker on after verifying the voltage and polarity, the inverter charger and its user interface should come to life. Okay. All the other breakers are off. So the inverter is going to be just sitting there inverting, right? So that is a great time. And here's, a, here's where we're going to measure those actually. So we see here on the right side here, we see the negative lead of your meter is going to go to the shunt. That's the shunt for measuring current for that battery monitor. The positive lead is going to go to the bottom side of the, of the main inverter breaker. This is where you connected your battery cable to the system. Okay, And we're going to measure the voltage and the polarity there first before turning on this big breaker. Because once you turn on that big breaker, if it's reverse polarity, you will hear the popping sound and the burning smell. Um, if it's, for instance, too high a voltage, same thing. If it's too low a voltage, now you're going to want to go back and find out why. If, in other words, if you have a 48 volt inverter, and you measure 12 volts, we want to find out what's going on there. It wouldn't damage the inverter, but it won't turn on either. So we want to verify that our voltages are within our expectations. You know, 48 volt inverter, probably somewhere between 46 and 55 or so. I mean, you know, um, you know, just verify that we have the right voltage. Okay. So this is when we're going to do, now that it's turned on, this is when we're going to do our basic programming. And all this stuff is going to be very quick because we have gathered all of our information earlier, right? Inverter stacking, again, that's only if applicable because uh, if you have a single inverter, you can skip past that one. The inverter charging voltages, right? So the inverter charger, so we've got our bulk absorb volts that we gathered earlier, the float volts that we gathered earlier, the absorb time that we gathered earlier, the two or three stage charging, again, Rebulk recharge volts. Okay. Then there's the low battery cutout. Again, we've gathered earlier, and the AC input amps, which is our breaker size of our generator. And then just know about that search mode thing. So we've done all of our basic in inverter programming, unless we're doing something like automatic gen start or, or time of use monitoring, things like that. The inverter is done at this point. So it's working. So what do we do? We want to test it. Real simple, turn it on, verify some output voltages, you know, look phase to phase or phase to neutral, you know, depending if you have a 120 or 12240 inverter, right? Just verify that you got good output. Now we're gonna turn on that out AC output breaker. Now that we know where it is, right? That's the one, um, just a pair in the case of this inverter, but it's the one that's labeled AC output. And that's gonna basically turn on your expected loads now. I mean, assuming your batteries are charged enough to handle them and make sure the inverter inverts, right? So now we're gonna be, then we test our inverter. It's working. Once we do that, we can now turn on the AC input breaker. That's gonna present the AC input to the inverter. At that point, if, if you have a generator, you can start your generator. And now we're just gonna verify that the inverter accepts and passes through the AC and charges. 
generally speaking, and this is something you're going to want to know for your particular inverter, but kind of a common theme here is there'll be an AC input LED on the inverter. When it sees an AC input from a generator or from the grid, it'll start blinking, blink, blink, blink. That means it's qualifying. It says, is this source indeed good? Once it says, okay, I like it, I'm going to use it, you'll see that AC input LED go solid and you'll hear the click of the internal relay. At that point, what you have on the output of your inverter and to your loads is what you have on the input or it's the generator. So shit in, shit out, I'm sorry. Um, if you have a bad generator, you're not gonna, you're not gonna condition it with the inverter. But um, so verify the inverter accepts and passes through the AC and then charge it. So look at your charger menu, make sure that if the batteries do need charging that they are in fact charging. And um, so you're done with the inverter basic test for charging and inverting. Charge controller, I'm gonna combine charge controller power up and, um, and programming into kind of a one slide because it's a lot simpler. So again, we're gonna verify the proper battery voltage and polarity at the charge controller output breaker. So if I go back a couple slides here, that's gonna be, the output breaker is gonna be one of these two. So we can go from negative to the one that's labeled um, charge controller output or charge controller battery breaker. We're gonna verify that that's correct. At that point, we can turn it on. Turn on the charge controller output breaker. That should bring the charge controller to life. And like the inverter, that's a great point to do your pro charge controller programming. So now we're gonna charge program our charge controller. One of the more in, important thing we're gonna check now is that the proper PV array input voltage and polarity of the combiner box and a PV input breaker. And so that was basically the other breaker here, right? We're gonna make sure we can turn on all of our, um, our charge or our, P, our combiner box breakers, verify that the voltage getting to this breaker is what we expect. In other words, if I have a 150 volt charge controller and I'm measuring their 600 volts, that means I put everything in series and go back and fix that prior to turning on the input breaker. Very important. Because again, that's a non-warrantable failure and it will fail very quickly. Do our basic programming. Um, and then we verify that it's charging. Now, when I say verify it's charging, one of the most frequent calls I get about charge controllers is actually, why isn't my charge controller charging? And I'll ask the customer, what's your float voltage set for? They'll tell me that number. And then I'll say, what's your battery voltage right now? And they'll tell me that same number. In other words, the batteries are full. So if you turn on the charge controller and it's not charging, first verify that the batteries need something. Because remember, the primary purpose of that charge controller is to prevent overcharging the batteries. So if it isn't in fact charging, it could just be because the batteries are full. Um, what you will see typically when you look at it. So when you connect the chart, when you connect the array voltage to a charge controller, most of them will tell you what the open circuit voltage is. And you'll see that voltage, say 120, whatever it is. Once it starts charging, you'll generally see that voltage go down, right? It started out at 120 volts. And as it starts ramping up and finding the max power point, it's going to actually decrease that voltage because it's going to be under load. And it's going to be somewhere closer to your max power voltage rating of your panel. And so we're going to verify it's charging, look at the amps, um, you know, make sure that you don't have any shading, uh, things like that. Verify that your PV is charging. Okay. Roy, uh, we've got about three minutes to go before the session's scheduled to end. Perfect. I can do it. Great. <laughs> so basic charge controller, real simple. We got the bulk absorbed volts that we gathered earlier. The absorb time generally isn't settable on many charge controllers. It's generally fixed, but some of them are. Um, but if it is, Set it for your you know, battery recommendation. Float volts, again, um, battery manufacturer recommendations. Rebulk um, by your battery manufacturer's recommendation. And here, what I have seen a number of times is the rebulk set too low. And the customer will call complaining that every day in the morning, charge controller, you know, the batteries are low, um, but the charge controller doesn't even go into bulk. It just goes straight to float. That could be your rebulk setting. Battery monitor program. This is the final slide, I believe. So we need to have the battery amp hours in capacity or battery capacity in amp hours, right? That's gonna be part of the programming um, because it needs to know. Charged, and I put a bowl on the D there. I always set it 
for 0.1 less than bulk for 12 volts, 0.2 less than bulk for 24 volts, 0.4 volts less than bulk for 48 volt systems. And the reason for this is you want to make darn sure that you hit it. I'm more, to me, I'm more concerned that we actually do reset than reset too late because it'll keep on charging. It's not going to affect your charge, right? So that you're getting from your battery manufacturer's set points that you, that you set earlier. Return amps, different thoughts on this one, two to 5% is the general consensus. I generally go at the 5% level because again, I'm re I really believe in resetting the thing. And efficiency, by the manufacturer recommendation, if you don't have one of those, set it for 85. Time, a couple minutes, nothing critical here. And so what happens is battery gets up to this, gets up to close to your bulk voltage. The charge or the battery monitor says, okay, we've hit one of our parameters. The current tapers down to less than say 5% of our total capacity in amp hours. The battery monitor says, okay, we've hit another parameter. It skip, the efficiency is just kind of a um, eh, kind of an accuracy along the fly. It does that for the period of time. Now the charge controllers or the um, the battery monitor says we've we've achieved parameters. I will now reset to 100%, and we will go on with our merry way again and keep on going. Um, and so it becomes more accurate if you if you look at your battery monitor and there's usually a way to see how many days since parameters met, and you see that it's been 90 days. You know that you've got something wrong or you're not charging your battery. So you should be hitting parameters every couple of days. So, <laughs> wow, I timed that well. <laughs>